Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first meeting of the Kinrosshire Local Area Committee of Perth and Kinross Council, including those who may be watching online. I had hoped our first meeting would have been in person in Kinross, but current COVID restrictions have not allowed for that. Hopefully this may be different when we come to our next meeting. <clears throat> I'm Councillor Barnacle, convener, and I'm assisted this evening by Councillor Purvis, vice convener, and a number of officers present. Um, I think at this stage, um, Audrey, would you like to give us a note of any apologies from the members circulated and also take a roll call of the attendance? <clears throat> um, yes, Councillor Barnacle, we have no, no apologies this evening. Um, good evening, members. When I call out your name, if you could please confirm that you are present. Councillor Barnacle, we've already heard from yourself. Councillor Purvis. Present. Councillor Robertson. Present. Councillor Waters. Present. Sarah Bruce Jones. Present. Uh, David Collier. Present. Present. Andy Miller. Present. Uh, Margaret Ponton, who I think we're still going to be trying to get into the meeting at the moment. Um, Fran Prince, Principe Gillespie. Present. And Malcolm Thompson. Present. Thank you. Um, we also have Councillor Lyle, leader of the council, um, here observing the meeting, as well as a number of officers from PKC in attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, do we have any declarations of interest from elected members? No. no. no from me. Um, we have a request for a deputation in relation to item five on the agenda. Do members agree to hear that prior to consideration of it? Agreed. 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 Now, the first item is um, item three, the Kinrosshire Local Committee Pilot Scheme of Administration. Um, as members may be aware, I've been campaigning for this area committee since I was first elected in 1999. <clears throat> this pilot has been established to allow us to test out a different approach to decision making in Kinrosshire over the next 12 months and it is up to us to make the best of the opportunity this gives us. In terms of the operation of the committee, the Council's committee services team will provide its usual support and the committee will have access to Council officers for advice, guidance and recommendations. As a Council committee, the Code of Conduct applies and I would ask that we, as I'm sure you, will do in any case, treat each other with respect and dignity at all times when undertaking this committee's business. The Kinrosshire Committee also involves representatives of each of the community councils in the ward, and we want to ensure that your views and opinions are taken into account throughout the decision-making process. This committee will focus on the physical place that is Kinrosshire and as such complements the local action partnership, which a number of us are also involved in and has a specific role in tackling local inequality. Um, you've all got a copy of the scheme um, and I would ask you to note that which we agreed with the council in October last. This was after long discussions between the local members and officers to agree an acceptable scheme. And it's important to note there will be an evaluation assessment of the committee's work after the pilot year. So that's all I wanted to say on that. And I think we, 
we just note that and, and move forward. <clears throat> um, as I say, if, if you want to make uh, a comment or have a question, Audrey points out that you um, you put that in the chat. And um, also, if, if for some reason you can't do that, raise your hand if you want to speak. Um, we'll move on then to item four, the 20 mile an hour speed limit trial. This is a this report is basically for noting since it was approved by the ENI committee on the 27th of October, of which Councillor Robertson and myself are members. Um, so what I would want you to do from that report is note paragraph one two in that although this was a trial for the whole of PKC, uh, we used a village straddling an A-class road, that village being Kineswood. Um, and in paragraph 2.2 of that report, um, of the five trial sites, there was strong community support for the retention of the 20 mile an hour speed limits introduced during the trial. Although, as evidenced, there is a lack of compliance by some drivers. Anyway, we proposed that the experimental traffic regulation order that was made for each site should be made permanent in the areas involved. Um, and paragraph 25. The approval of this report will not have any impact on the prioritisation criteria agreed by the committee because there's approximately 800 potential schemes currently on the database. Um, I think para 2.6, um, I wanted you to note that in the rural villages with no footways where pedestrians share the road with vehicular traffic, this was part of the spaces for people physical distancing project. And it assisted the increased pedestrian activity by lowering vehicle speeds. That was in the temporary limits that we also introduced through government funding. Um, now the recommends in Paragraph 3.3, three, particularly number four, requests that a report will be produced with recommendations on the temporary spaces for people, lower limits, or alternatively for their removal and reinstatement. It's important to note that will not be without further consultation with the communities involved. Um, and on the appendix, which if particularly in Kineswood, if you see the appendix, note for 4.6, um, those that 20 that 20 mile an hour limit was also accompanied with speed cushions through Kineswood, and the council had received complaints and requests to remove them, remove them that was being investigated. I thought that was an important point. And 411, the point was made that the combination of traffic calming measures on Main Street did not reduce vehicle speeds to an acceptable level to be self regulating for a 20 mile an hour limit. And you'll note in Appendix 6 the costs of the trial in Kineswood. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight those points from the report that was approved at the Environment Committee. I don't know, Daryl, whether Daryl McCowan uh, of the Roads Department, whether you wish to expand on that report, on what I've said in any way or form. Are you are you present, Daryl? I am convener, yes. Um, yeah, Kineswood was the one site, so the five trial sites in Ward 8. We've got numerous sites uh, across the council, uh, sorry, across the, the Kinross area that would be in the spaces for people. Uh, temporary speed limits. We're currently reviewing those sites. We've been undertaking the traffic surveys and there will be a full report submitted to committee in due course. 
Um, what we did notice in Kines Wood, the, the road alignment there, the, the narrowness of the road, the narrowness of the footways, the presence of the vehicles on either side certainly helped to bring speeds down in the core of the village. Where we still are seeing higher speeds is on the periphery, uh, the entrance points into the village. And that's where we may, we will, I think going forward, we will want to discuss with the community about possible relocation or additional use of speed cushions uh, or vehicle activated signs. The vehicle, the, the, the two speed cushions that were in the core of the village that had previously been agreed, uh, one, once they were in place due to noise and vibration, they were removed and there still is an option to, to, to add those in at another location within the village. OK, thanks very much, Daryl. Now I see in the chat box that uh, Andy Miller of Portmouth CC wants to make a comment. Andy? Yes, good evening, uh, Mike, and thanks very much for the update on that. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, uh, the Kineswood area falls directly within our uh, our particular boundary, and I, I appreciate that, that what everybody's saying is there are numerous sites that are being looked at for speed restrictions throughout the Perth and Kinross area. But but obviously, this is that the, the Kinrossshire committee. Uh, we obviously are interested in things that are happening in our own particular area. Um, what I would like to to just focus in on is the is is the report itself, uh, and as you quite rightly have stated, <coughs> it it kind of shows that um, the physical uh, or sorry the, the the speed restriction alone i.e reducing to 20 mile an hour limits has had little or no effect tangibly on speed through both Kineswood and, and, and as a resident of Scotland well I do know there's been a similar study down here um, and, and you know it doesn't seem that any real reduction has been uh, mirrored by putting in the the, the, the signage that's there um, even though we do also have the the speed cushions now I believe the reduction is about one mile per hour from the 30 mile an hour limit down to the 20 and we're still seeing a 85th percentile uh, of circa 33 miles an hour in a 20 zone so what what I think we we, we acknowledge uh, uh, at community council level and certainly the the ward councillors who have attended the meetings have acknowledged is that um, we do need uh, physical mitigation. Um, the vehicle activated signage does not seem to be doing uh, overly much to to actually physically reduce the speed. And I think that um, certainly from uh, our community perspective. Um, you know, we would certainly like to to encourage or or find out what the council's um, opinion is and going forward on how we actually physically get these speeds down because the, you know there's no point having a 20 mile hour zone if uh, nobody adheres to that. So we're looking at physical uh, physical traffic calming measures or enforcement. Um, and that, that's kind of where we would like to see this going, certainly in the local community. And I appreciate that, you know, 20 mile an hour speed limits are not just for Kineswood, Scotland. Well, they will be looked at, at other parts of Perth and Kinross. But, but I think that, that basically what we're saying is that in a lot of these cases, the, the reduction, simple reduction of, of putting the 20 mile an hour lollipop up does not seem to have the effect that's desired. OK, uh, I see, Daryl, that you wish to answer that comment. Uh, would you like to come in? Yeah, I think the, the statement there is correct that the signs alone would bring, a, bring about a minimum reduction. We were surprised from the report that we were expecting to see a greater reduction from the vehicle activated signs. We only saw a small reduction in overall speeds. However, the vehicle activated signs have been effective in eliminating the excessive speeds. So we've, we've seen a, a noticeable drop and almost an elimination of those very high speeds. Now by excessive speed, we're talking um, about 15 miles per hour above the speed limit. That's sort of the Department for Transport uh, and Police Scotland definition. Uh, so we, we have we managed to reduce those high speeders, but yeah, we are still seeing speeds in you know in the upper 20s in the low 30s and um, I think going ahead the, the one of the, the implications for us will be the, the the budget resources that will be required to introduce the physical measures but it'll also involve a lot of negotiation with local communities because as we saw with Kness Wood you know the original location of one of the sets of speed cushions was creating additional problems i.e noise and, and, and vibration so uh, there'll be a lot of discussion with the local communities 
uh, in the months ahead regarding this. OK, thank you, uh, Daryl. I see that um, Margaret Ponton has now joined us. Evening, Margaret. We're just going through the, uh, the 20, 20 mile an hour trial report. Thank you, Mike. Um, there's a couple of questions coming. Andy, do you want to come back in with a question? Yeah, just, I, I, see, uh, I know that Callum wants to comment, but I'll just deal with these two questions first. Andy, you're coming back in. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Mike. I'll try and keep this very brief because I know there's a lot to cover. Um, OK, so so I appreciate exactly what has been said there regarding uh, Daryl's answer uh, and allocated funding. Um, obviously, from from a, a local community viewpoint, can rush your community viewpoint, what I'd like to know for the areas in question what we are seeking or what is allocated in terms of speed mitigation for this area, if at all possible. And then quite simply, it then boils down to there must be a ready rule of reckoning on in terms of what each individual measure costs, i.e. whether it be speed bumps, whether it be road cushions, whether it be traffic plateaus or whatever. I'm sure that's been costed out. So what, what is useful, I believe, and would certainly be useful for the communities is to understand what, if anything, they can expect to be coming out of this uh, in, in due course. So I'll leave it at that if I can. I trust you will note that, Daryl. Um, in fact, do you want to do you want to say any more on that? Yeah, but yeah, it was just to say that yes, we have those costings. Uh, so you know, typical examples of different forms of of speed reduction measure, and we can set up a meeting with the the communities with the, you know in the, in the local villages to go through the various options with local representatives. Thanks very much. Now, I see, Councillor Waters wanted to ask a question, Richard. Thanks, thanks, convener. Just, just regarding the, the 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 speed cushions and and the location of them, it always seems a bit unfair that 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 when they're in a built-up area and they're next to people's houses, they do tend to cause cause a noise disturbance, and it does tend to be at night time when things are a bit quieter, and they hear the rumbling of a uh, uh, cars and that go by. It, 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 if there is a potential, with potential in moving it out of where the built up areas are uh, are they as effective or 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 if if they're out with the area or, or does that get compromised a wee bit where people then once they're over them just start speeding up to the the speed they might have been doing anyway yes Darrell. Uh, the the trial showed and this is supported from other surveys but that you, you require a, a whole series of traffic calming measures. If we just have them at the entrance to the village or the periphery of the village where there's less frontage development, you'll find that the speeds are lowered at that point. But once the driver has passed that particular traffic calming measure, then we notice the vehicle speeds will start to increase again. So you need to have them repeated along the route. We, did, we put in the speed cushions uh, at all of the sites so we would have a similar type of speed reduction measure at each of the five trial sites. In Kineswood, you also have the priority systems. And they work well whenever you've got a constant flow of traffic in each direction. So it, 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 it's probably a case of you know, each site needs to be assessed separately. Um, if speed cushions are not acceptable in the core of a village because of noise and things, we, we, we can look at other options. But again, you know, it's going to have to be on a site by site basis. Thank you, Daryl. Now, uh, I think uh, Councillor Purvis, you wanted to comment. Uh, you put a, a comment in in the chat box a while ago. Do you, you want to come in now, uh, Callum? <clears throat> Just very briefly, um, and thank you, Daryl, for, for, for the report, um, which I had looked at when it went to, to e I as well. Um, I think it's really useful to have the, the evidence uh, basis and being able to actually see what effect um, or not um, those measures have had. Um, and I suppose it is a, it's a difficult balancing act, isn't it? You know, there's a strong desire um, in local communities to have um, lower speed limits. Um, but in, in some of these instances, it doesn't look like it's had the effect that we might have hoped. However, um, the, interesting the point you raise again about the um, reducing excessive speeds, which is important in and of itself. Um, but we also then want on the other, you know, on the other side of that sp speed limits to be self-enforcing. Um, so I think I'm, I'll be really interested when um, 
the reports come back on the spaces for people um, speed limits, the, the 20 mile an hour ones, because I know that we have a number in Kinross, and um, the two extensions, one in Kinross, one in Milnathort, and then I think Drum, Kelty Bridge, Maryborough, um, I think that's all of them. Um, and then at that point, um, you know, alongside the community councils, I think it will be interesting to get views of the wider community. Um, you know, we'll have the empirical evidence as to whether they've actually brought speeds down or not, but what the views of the community are too, um, because I think that we've got to take both of those into account when we're we're making those decisions and making future decisions about any any further introduction of 20 mile an hour. So um, thank you for that. Just a very brief question. I know that it's not, not in order a uh, convener to uh, ask a question at this point, but um, do we have a time scale roughly for for when um, those spaces for people assessments might be might be done, Daryl? Uh, they're underway at the moment and the intention would be to report to ENI committee uh, later this calendar year. Um, and either the whole report or the section of the report that refers to Ken Ross can come back to a future meeting of this committee. OK, that's fine. Thanks very much. I think since basically we were just noting the ENI report, I think we can we can move on from that now, um, but it will be minuted what's been discussed. Um, let's now go to item five which is the a911 east of scotland well and i would call on uh, vice convener purvis to take this report over to you callum thank you convener um as as many of you will be aware um speeding on the a911 has been an issue um that has been raised for quite some time um, and concerns have been raised by local residents and, and the wider local community um, about um, the uh, issues that have been faced and, and accidents that have happened on that on that stretch. Um, we have a report before us um, that uh, the road safety team have put together setting out um, the, the evidence um, and uh, making a recommendation. Um, as you know, we have had a request for a deputation from local residents. Um, so what I will do is um, invite uh, Mr Lowry, if he is here, can committee services advise if he's in the meeting. Yeah. Great. OK, right. Um, hi, um, Ali, are you happy if I call you Ali? Yes, yes, yeah. that's absolutely fine. Can, can you OK, Ali, me? you have 10 minutes. Um, I'll give you um, an idea when it's uh, one minute to go, just so that you know when you're um, having to um, wrap up. Um, and then once you have uh, concluded, um, the members of the committee will have the opportunity to ask you questions. Um, so just when you're ready, um, if you want to, to start your deputation. Lovely. Thank you, Callum. Um, I'd like to start by saying uh, hello and thank you very much um, to all the councillors so far for their support and what they're trying to achieve um, for a lower, lower speed limit in our section of the A911. Um, there's two things that I want to bring up with you all this evening. First of all, I want to, to talk about the aforementioned council report and some of our um, some of our concerns with it and then move on to our desired outcomes and why we want them really, just to give you an, uh, an idea as to why we're asking what we're asking. Um, to touch briefly just on the report that you've, that's been mentioned that you've all, I'm assuming, had a chance to look through. Um, first thing I'd just like to mention on there is that the, this request that we are making uh, isn't, that isn't just coming from one or two houses at West Bowl House. Um, it's coming from the entire community which live, uh, which live on this section of the A911. Um, you're talking about 25 houses over a 500 metre stretch, as well as another 10 at Kiniston, who have all given unanimous support for what we are trying to achieve in lowering the speed limit. Um, another thing that I'd quite like to mention that, that wasn't really brought up in the report is the road layout, and that contributes a lot to our concerns about the speed limit and why we want it reduced. Um, we're all aware of the big long stretch uh, of straight road on the A911 that runs past a lot of our houses. Um, but at either end of that road, you have you have got at one end you've got a, a blind a blind summit leading onto the long straight at Arnott, and then down at the other end you have got a blind dip with an adverse camber and a sharp bend to the right. Um, which you were on, if you're unaware of the layout of the road, you do not even see is there until very late on. Um, and that is the reason why nearly every accident that has caused issue in this road has been on that corner. Um, it is not safe. Uh, it is not safe in any way, shape, or form to have a 60 mile an hour limit leading up to and onto that road. Um, 
and indeed um the, the the report also mentions um with regards to accidents um that have taken place um and it, uh, it the report concedes that there might have been some unreported accidents which they haven't been included in the report um just a couple of things to mention on on that particular aspect um none of the residents were aware that it was the onus was on us to photograph evidence and report uh, accidents that took place on this road um the, the report gives a time scale of um, a time span of 2016 to 2020 um, with no reported accidents. I mean, I personally was on down on the corner mentioned and in the field in many cases, pulling people out of cars and whatnot who had come off the road. Um, as you can probably imagine, the last thing I'm going to do is take photographs of it that, 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 in that case. Um, but if, if police aren't called, then it doesn't tend to get reported. So, and if, you, if you're driving down that road regularly, you regularly see fresh skid marks, um, bits of car, bits of bumper, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just having a garden that overlooks um, the, the, this fine corner that's caused a lot of the accidents. Um, I can tell you that frequently it's almost a daily occurrence you see people uh, notice the, the road layout far too late doing 60 plus and um, struggling to get around it in one piece, um, which is why we're so passionate about it and it's such an area of concern for us. Um, and finally, with regards to the, the report, the issues with regards to the children um, that are crossing and using this road regularly, and it's something I'll come on to in a lot more depth, but it was very uh, barely mentioned in the report that was made. Um, on to our desire, the desired outcomes and why we want them, I think I think we I can say on behalf of the community unanimously that we want a reduction in speed on this section of the road to 40 miles per hour. Um, the reasons why, and um, trying to put it as simply as possible, um, our long straight stretch of road on the on the A911 um, lies between the two areas which are at 40 miles per hour um, and lower further on from there. Um, what that in effect what, what in effect happens is our long straight gets used as a runway. Um, cars taxi at the 40 mile an hour bends and whatnot up to it, and then absolutely rocket as soon as that is that is um, within sight of that 60 mile an hour uh, stretch. Um, now that encourages unsafe driving because cars and um, people using the road are trying to make up the time that they have lost by sitting behind slower cars or farm farm tractors etc etc um if you speak to anybody with who lives on this section of road and they will all tell you about a near miss or a collision that they have had trying to come out of their driveway or go into their driveway um it's a very regular regular occurrence um in particular when you're trying to come out your driveway you can't really see and there's cars trying to overtake and coming screaming out of the, the blind summits with the blind dips and right up the, the straight road um the um the other thing i'd like i'd like to um move on to with regards to why we want the, the speed reduction um I mentioned briefly the, the layout layout of the road now this this contributes um quite a lot to I think one of the main points really in this which is the children um this uh, section of road with 25 houses on it, as you can probably imagine there's a lot of children that get um on school buses that are going to school on this road uh, there are four school buses that stop on this road twice a day um we, we there is at least 15 to 20 kids um on any given day that are getting on and off school buses twice a day on this road um and it is not even remotely safe um and leads to the I think for me certainly the main main area of concern here. Um, our crossing points um, to get over to the school bus stops are severely reduced because we have no path, we have no footpath, we have nothing. We've got a grass verge, and then a very uh, road with very fast moving traffic on it. Um, the points in which we have to cross are, are not, and certainly at West Bow House, um, are not a, a safe distance away from the from the corners um, and the blind hills leading onto this long straight. Um, We've had the, the, the stopping distance is not safe whatsoever, so you really have to have your wits about you when you cross that road. Because if a car rockets out of the out of the blind summit and over the blind hill doing 60 miles an hour, then it's going to struggle to stop in time um, and not hit one of the kids. Um, when you have um, negotiated getting over, over the road, you've also got the fact that you're standing um, in, in many cases for many of the children on this road on a grass verge inches away from fast flowing traffic at 60 miles an hour. And this in particular is a point that the, the, the data taken from the report just cannot assess and cannot pick up um, the danger that you have when you're standing with your children on the side of this road and the cars and um, trying to make up time doing 60 miles an hour plus overtaking each other and going past. Um, which brings me on to the other point, obviously these school buses when they're dropping off and picking up their kids are stopping 
um, and they're stopping on this long section of road. Um, the places where they, the only available places they've got to stop are not a huge, really a huge distance whatsoever away from the, the Arnold end and the West Bow House end uh, corners and hills. Um, and what happens on a daily occurrence is that cars will um, be coming out of be coming out onto the long straight at 60 miles an hour and they will be overtaken. And the other cars will either have to abandon the overtaking manoeuvre because they see a, a stopped school bus, or they will have to speed it up in order to get in before hitting the school bus. And you can imagine the, the fear that we have um, watching this as our children are getting on and off the, the, the school bus. Um, and all that means to just give you an idea of the speed, using the council's data that they put in the report, there are 90 vehicles a day using that road going over 60 miles an hour. I think we can all probably assume that the majority of the usage of the road is going to be in, in rush hour times. Um, so generally speaking, times when people are to and from work and to and from school runs, um, when the school bus is there, stops. Um, so the, the risk is, is absolutely huge. Um, and using, again, um, harking back to the data, the, the 85th percentile speed limit on speed um, that's been done on that road is 57 miles per hour. Um, if one of those cars being 57 miles per hour, and which is within the safest speed limit, hits our children, there's a 95 percent chance those kids are going to die. And um, so you can see why we are so passionate about getting this um, this situation resolved and getting it reduced. It's just not safe whatsoever. Um, so that is our main desired outcome of why we want we want the speed reduced to 40 miles an hour to put it in line with the, with, um, the rest of the equally populated areas of this stretch of road. Um, second use of that certainly is some signage. I've mentioned this um, already, but um, there are no signs whatsoever. There is nothing at all to signify that there's any children crossing that road. There's no school bus signs. There's no uh, children crossing signs. Um, there is a couple of horse, cro horse crossing signs, um, which is a, a bit bizarre. Um, there's no school bus stop. Um, I mean, th there is, there's nothing to tell you that the road has been regularly used by children. Um, one minute out. One minute left, okay. Um, a couple of other points worth, worth making. Um, the overtaking is a serious issue, and certainly there should be um, double lines on the road around the blind corners and over the summit so we can stop people pulling out and overtaking as soon as, right as they get onto the street and putting their lives and our lives at risk, basically. Um, longer term, I think this harks back to the fact that we are a community, which is sort of ignored within the report. Um, we visit each other's houses regularly on the stretch of road. Um, we don't have a safe footpath to do that. We don't have a safe footpath to go into Scotland well. Um, so certainly one of our, our, I think our final desired outcome is having a safe footpath um, to get to and from Scotland well and to get to each other's houses so, so we can safely do that um, and not put lives at risk really. And, and finally, the environmental impact. Um, every time we need to go for a pint of milk, we need to take the car. Um, with everything that's going on with the environment, it's not ideal. Um, but certainly our number one desired outcome is the speed reduction with the rest, the rest following in order, as I put them out and say. Um, and thank you. Okay. For, for thank you, Ali. That's, that's your time. Thank you very much. Um, right, now I'll invite uh, members of the committee to indicate if they would like to ask any questions um, of Ali on his deputation. Um, just to remind everyone that there will be an opportunity to ask uh, questions of officers on the report. And um, so this is purely if anyone has any questions or points of clarity on Ali's deputation that they would like to ask. Councillor Waters. Thank you, Vice Convener. Thanks, thanks for that uh, deputation, uh, Mr. Lowry. Can can I just ask a bit, bit more information on the the, the, the children in the school buses? Uh, what mm -hmm. what age what age are the kids that are that are kind of crossing the road in the morning? I, I assume, given that there's four buses, there's going to be um, some for primary school and some for secondary school. Can you just give a bit more information on that? Thanks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, we've certainly got um, we've got one primary school bus for Port Moak. We've got um, the high school bus for Kinross, and we've got two other high school buses as well. One of them is a dollar bus for private, the private school, which I'm pretty sure from memory does all the way from five up till till the final year. So you'll get a mixture on there. Um, certainly, I can I know from speaking to other residents, and they are that, that they are um, there's some older kids that and that get up near closer to Arnott. Um, they have a nightmare because they're right on the grass fairs. They don't think they've got anything, so they're they're inches away from the fast flowing traffic. Um, I, particularly from my personal experience at West Coast House, um, we've got in all we've got five, so I should say four primary school children, one high school child, 
and we're very soon to be joined by another two primary school ch children, so we'll have eight of us all together at, the, at our area waiting to get on and off the bus. Um, but there are, as I said, there are numerous from, from up at Arnott. Arnott being up at the other side, I don't know the children as well as they do at my end, but I know from speaking to other residents that have given more support that there are numerous kids up there of, of, uh, of school age. Just sorry, just just regarding, I, I noticed in the report that there was supposed to be a a, a bus area uh, built as part of the as part of the the development when it's built when it was built. Is, is that still earmarked to happen, or is that just something that's vanished in yes, time and, and right, delivered? Yes, you're right. The council did mention the report. So as part of the planning, as part of um, condition for getting planning to build our houses, the onus was put on the developer to build a school bus stop. Um, to keep this short and sweet, the developer didn't bother. The developer then went bust, and that was best part of 15 years ago. And no, the obviously the council has been taken on, and no enhancements been done in order to put one in there. Um, but I mean, we haven't got one, and, and certainly there's no, there's no, there's none elsewhere as well on that stretch. Thank, you. thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Waters. Um, Andy, you have a, a question. Yeah, apologies. I seem to be monopolising things, but it just tends to fall in our area at the moment, or certainly this evening. And um, that was kind of where I was coming from because it's something I picked up. Something I picked up in the uh, in the report uh, item one three thirteen um, that the bus boarding area was conditioned on planning approval. Um, now I, I'm not entirely sure where this sits in planning, and and obviously Mr. Lowry has said that the the developer has effectively gone bust. Now, um, I, I'm not entirely sure when the um, three houses at Bow House that are completed um, were were completed. I mean, I, I, it's certainly in my term uh, within Scotland Wales, so that's within the last 10 years. So I'm, I'm just I'm just querying it um, in terms of planning. Has that condition for the provision of a bus stop not simply been um, enacted into what would have to be a revised planning, I would have imagined, if the original developer has gone bust for uh, a, a provision of a bus stop. Is that is that a question for, for Ali or, or perhaps one that it maybe... Was, uh, the question originally to Ali was, you know, has he been in discussions with the developer to find out why the bus stop has not been provided? It seems like um, his answer to Richard was, was um, you know, that the developer has gone bust, but but on the back of that, then we need to find out through the relative planning process who then is responsible for it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the developer when the developer went bust, uh, oh, a good, I think a good eight years before we we, we bought our particular house. Um, so who knows? But I, I would imagine there's got to be if the council is giving a conditional planning, I would imagine there's got to be small print somewhere that dictates what needs to happen if then the developer doesn't carry out or is unable to. Um, so yeah, I imagine that there's something that should have been done there, but it's obviously been uh, it's not been picked up. Okay, I see that um, Peter Marshall is um, able to come in and perhaps provide some additional clarity on this point. Peter, uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, it's it's a very difficult area, um, and I must admit, I my side of planning is not development management, so I'm not uh, an absolute expert on this, but. Where um, a condition is not uh, applied to and the developer has gone burst, there is no way of taking action against that developer. There are some form of conditions which may fall upon as an obligation to the householder. I doubt if this would apply this case. So in effect, there is no way of enforcing anyone to take action on this. That may not be right, but it's the way the legislation stands at the moment. Had it been a Section 75 agreement, which I'm presuming in this case it wasn't, the onus would then definitely have fallen on the existing householder. So um, I can ask our uh, enforcement officers to you know, provide a more detailed opinion or confirm my opinion, but obviously I can't get that answer tonight. Thank okay. you. That would be helpful, Peter, if you're if you're happy to pick that up and and make that available to members at a later date. Um, are there any further questions on the deputation? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ali, for coming along and uh, making that deputation, and we will um, proceed uh, to consider the the item in front of us. Thank you.
Thank you. OK, thanks. Right, before we move to questions on the report, um, I just checked, Daryl, is there anything you want to, to say um, to start or are you happy to move straight to questions? Uh, I'm happy to move straight to questions. OK, right, we'll start with Councillor Robertson. Uh, thanks, uh, Vice Convener. Um, I noticed that the, in the in the report, the proposals are or one of the proposals are to do a, a traffic, a, a road safety action plan for A911. Now, my understanding is um, that the road safety team is extremely understaffed and there's a huge, huge backlog of works requiring to be done. Um, I know that uh, uh, Mr McEwen does his utmost to try and keep things moving forward, but even I know of a huge backlog of things that I'm waiting for. So I would want to know how, when a route action plan is likely to be delivered and do we have the staff in place to actually put the recommendations from the route action plan into, uh, into action in any sort of reasonable time? Darrell. I'll answer the second part of that first, if I may, uh, Councillor Robertson. We don't know what the recommendations are yet, so it's difficult to say when they would be implemented. The Route Action Plan looks at an entire route rather than uh, just a, a small section of a road. Uh, so we would be looking at the route from Milton Authority right through to Ockmere Bridge. It looks at both rural and urban sections. We look at traffic flow, um, um, categories of vehicle speed, direction of flow. We look at collision history, casualty history and the contributory factors that leads to those collisions. Um, so we will be looking at that whole route and this year we have uh, put in route action plans as being one of our performance indicators within the team and the A911 route action plan is one of the routes to be to, to be delivered um, the, the target was before the end of this uh, financial year and we're currently working on that um, but we don't know what the full list of recommendations will be and when they will be implemented. Some of them, such as making the temporary reduced speed limits permanent, could be implemented within the next 12 months. Uh, but others, if we are looking at crash barrier or anti-skid surfacing, where, where we are bringing in a specialised contractor, an external contractor, we'll need to look at budget and we'll need to look at the availability of the contractors to do the work. So it, I think all the, not all the recommendations would necessarily be implemented at the one time. They would probably be looking over the next two financial years. Uh, again, it, it will depend on what comes out of the report. Uh, can, thanks for that. Can I possibly come back? I think, um, sorry, so, Councillor Robertson, I think uh, Mark Butterworth wanted to, to supplement the response and then I'll come back to you for a, a further point, if that's all right. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Pears. I think it, it's a really good question. As, as Darren has said, in terms of the route action plan, we're doing our business planning uh, at the moment, so we'll be looking to probably do four or five route action plans next year, but that's not to say they will be implemented. Um, and I think just in terms of managing expectations, you know, I think the report may, makes mention or certainly the previous report of we've got approximately 800 schemes in uh, on our database, which are schemes which are, you know, a mix of schemes which are really important and, and really you know high priority and others less so but there is a big demand for for you know road safety schemes across Perth and Kinross and, and the way we manage our budgets at the moment is across Perth and Kinross not just w within any one particular area and um, so we do really need to be clear about expectations but what we will be able to do is when we bring back the recommendations we'll certainly be a bit clearer in terms of how uh, the time scales around implementing those recommendations but it will be a case of um, looking at the relative priorities across the area so we don't we don't want to be suggesting by any means you know it will be very soon but at the same time until we know what those recommendations are and um, we don't want to be suggesting that it, it will be a long time either so we'll bring that clarity back hopefully when we bring the report back which which i'm sure will be a, 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 just a matter of uh, months in terms of the the recommendations thank you councillor robertson yes uh, thank you that that's actually very helpful but one of the questions i did ask is about the staffing levels in the road safety team. Are the road safety team uh, fully staffed now? Because I know there was money put in the budget last February. Um, 
so if they're fully staffed, can that mean does that mean that we're now going to be getting a quicker turnaround in requests from from mm -hmm. members of the public and from councillors? Mark, you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Councillor Pepps. In terms of fully staffed, I think we there are one or two vacancies still in the team. I think in terms of putting more money into the budget, that was absolutely the case. But I think that was for temporary uh, staff, and I think it was only for for um, a twelve month period, um, not permanent uh, or longer term contracts. And I think the difficulty we have and we have had in terms of recruiting is the fact that that short term nature of the funding doesn't help us with with that recruitment. You know, we will we will never say we've got enough resources. We will always say we need more and the more you know, the bigger the team and the more resources, the quicker we can get through things. And um, what we do is obviously prioritise. And um, but it's not just about the staff and of course, which is an important uh, point. It is also about the, the 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 budget in terms of implementing the the schemes as well. So we have got almost a full team, but but it will ne never be enough. I don't think. Okay, th thanks for that. I think you 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 clearly both you and Mr. McEwen have clearly demonstrated the the pressures that the road safety team are under just now. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Robertson. Councillor Waters, you had uh, two questions, I think. Yeah, are you, are you okay for me to ask them both uh, straight away, uh, Callum? Well, if you want a response after each one, happy to take them separately. If right. whatever okay. you prefer. I'll do the I'll do the quick one first. The the, the one point three point one four uh, covers um, the the children crossing the the road and the criteria that's set out. Uh, I noticed the the survey, the initial survey that's mentioned in this report, is is was done um, out of school term time. So, so one would expect the road to be considerably quiet. When you when you're saying that there was a hundred vehicles provided uh, uh, between uh, eight and nine o'clock, is that is that based on a separate a separate traffic survey, or is it based on is it based on the one that you mentioned previously within the report? Darryl? Yeah, it was based on the one the, the the survey that was mentioned in the report. You said considerably quiet. There's very little difference between term and non-term time traffic surveys. Um, th there is a slight change in the timings of the vehicles using the route, but over the course of the day, traffic volumes are generally the same. And we see this repeated at uh, most of the, 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 the surveys that we do across the council area. Thank you. This, it does, from a driver perspective, it does quite often seem that it's it's, it's quieter uh, out of term time, and you seem to get paid to be quicker. But I, I won't I won't uh, argue the point. Um, on on one one of the things I quite often uh, uh, struggle with on that that road, and and is the the, the fact from local even larder, uh, travelling all the way to to, to Leslie. The, the 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 speed jumps you know from you know 40 to 30 to 40 to 20 and and, and it's very intermittent and we do have stretches along that road that are straight that that are at 40 miles per hour uh, and and then we've got the the stretch where where the residents are, are really concerned uh, which then is up to national speed limit, and then when you head hit into Fife, it's back down to 40 again. And and the the amount of roads, I, I, I tried to count it the other day and reckoned there was about 20 roads coming on and off or, or joining that road uh, along the stretch that, that we're chatting about in this this report. And, and it does seem to get a bit confusing the reasoning behind why it jumps back and forward and yet at this section it's still 60 miles an hour we, we have clear issues and, and 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 I share the concerns of the residents having stayed in a rural location with young kids that had to do exactly what these kids are going to do and and cross a very busy road or, or a road where people tended to drive uh, uh, very fast and I just want to, a bit of explanation of why why other areas of the road classify quite easily as 40 and why this this section uh, uh, you, you, you're saying it can and 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 on the, the other sections you know certainly certainly just before you get to Kineswood you know which is a straight section as 40 miles per hour 
is there compliance on that on that stretch? Do we do we know that or 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 um, there seems to be less tracks coming off it, or less roads coming onto it, and yet the the, the it is it is forty miles an hour um, compared to the the stretch by uh, uh, Bowhouse and up to Arnett. Thank you. Okay, Daryl. Yeah, there's a few things I just want to clarify there. There's reference made to it being a 60 miles per hour road. The road's subject to the national speed limit. Some vehicles are already restricted uh, to 40 miles per hour. Um, so, I mean, it, it depends on the type of vehicle that is using the route. The, uh, the reference to it being a very busy road, I think in the report we demonstrate that in comparison to all our A-class roads, uh, both in the Kinross area and elsewhere in Perth and Kinross Council, it's not one of our busier routes. Um, that the volume of traffic is significantly lower than uh, than the likes of the A977 or in some of our urban areas. The in, re in reply to the, the reason why the speed limit changes, this is something which has been addressed a number of times in consultation with elected members in the Community Council. It used to just be that Kinesswood Wood and Scotland Well villages had the, the national urban speed limit of 30 miles per hour and all other sections of the road were subject to national speed limit um, over the years uh, because of the, the, the short distance between Kines Wood and Scotland while the speed limit there was lowered. The two communities at Easter Bulgetti and Wester Bulgetti had petitioned uh, for a lower speed limit and they're recognised as settlements within the local development plan. And um, with the spaces for people uh, project last year and the temporary speed limits that, that were put in to accommodate the increased pedestrian and cycling activity, we saw a further change. Western Bulgetti, Easter Bulgetti were reduced to 30, Scotland Well and Kines, well Kineswood was part of the 20 miles per hour trial, but Scotland Well was reduced to 20 miles per hour and we are reviewing all of those speeds at the moment. Uh, that is the sort of thing that we'll be looking at in the route action plan. I think what we have seen at West Bay House, Mid Bay House, East Bay House at Arnott, you're seeing a much more sporadic development. There's less concentration of it. Um, you're, you talk about the number of roads linking onto it. I mean, your private access is coming onto it. There are no public roads on that section east of Scotland Well. Um, there's less frontage development. There's a lot of ribbon development, but with the with more and more of these sites now being built on, it's something that we can consider. As you're coming out of Scotland well, there is a short section of 40 miles per hour buffer on the Leslie Road, and that was to encourage better compliance with the 20 within the village. Um, and we'll see more uh, information on that coming out of the report. Um, but the section from West Bay House up towards Arnott, the overtaking uh, site distance is there. Visibility is good. We know that speeds are higher, but that's because the visibility is good. Um, we wouldn't consider, uh, in consultation with the police, we don't consider a lower speed limit to be appropriate at this stage. We don't consider the double line system and overtaking system to be appropriate because you have full overtaking sight distance. What we can look at is the, the, the road markings through the bends. At the moment, we have the longer center line marking, which is a hazard marking or a warning marking that advises drivers that they shouldn't be overtaking. It, it advises of a change in the road layout. We can assess that and we can consider putting in a double line system. And also at the, 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 the blind crest that uh, Mr. Larry referred to up at Arnott, but the section in the, in the middle, which is full overtaking sight distance, it doesn't comply with the legislation within the signs regulations. So we can't consider a double line system there. There are warning signs as you when you're coming from Leslie towards Scotland well off the hidden dip off the bends in the road. Um, again, we can look to see whether they need to be upgraded or repositioned uh, or enhanced, but at least the signs are there. They are clearly visible. There's nothing obscuring them. Uh, going back to the, the, the issue about the hard standing area, we can certainly take a look at that and see whether we can construct a hard standing area bus border uh, for, for the school children. But we have school children being dropped off and picked up on rural roads right across the council area. Um, and you know, it's not practical or possible in, in many cases to put in uh, a hard standing area 
I think one of the difficulties here is the road, the ground drops away from the road, so we need to do some site investigation and see a liaise with, with, with Peter uh, and his, his team in planning, and we take a look at the, the, the planning consent. If there's nothing that could be done, it's something that we could pick up through the route action plan. OK, can, thank I, can you. I just ask a quick supplementary, please, Karen? Uh -huh. On you go. Uh, just, just, just on signs saying that there's children crossing the road, is it possible? Is, is it possible to do that over a, a wider stretch? Right, because because there's 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 a, a few places along the road where kids are getting picked up, and rather than repeating a sign, if you've got a sign kind of covering it from from uh, uh, Wester Bowhouse all the way up to to on the other end, probably Arna or something, is it possible to do something like that? Darrell. There is no sign within the signs regulation that covers that specific action. There are warning signs of the boy and girl symbol that you see would, uh, they, they can only be put outside a school playground or if there's a school crossing patroller, there's a supplementary plate that goes onto the sign to explain to the driver what the hazard is. You would put up a warning sign if there were pedestrians regularly walking along a road, the, the adult and child warning sign. But we don't have a sign for children crossing a road at school time to get on or off the school bus. And um, that's something which is not currently permitted within the signs regulations. But again, uh, you know, I'm not sure where you would stop because you'll have the bus stopping the whole length of, of that road. I think it was pointed out earlier that you know the, the bus that there are multiple bus stops for the for the local school children. OK, thank you. Thank um, Andy, you had a question and a comment. If I could have the question now, please, if that's possible, and then we'll take the comments um, later on, if that's OK. Andy. Yeah, OK, so I think uh, I think one of the questions that I was going to ask has been answered, uh, Callum, so I'd rather just make a comment, if that's possible, in due course. OK, thank you very much. Um, I had a couple of questions then um, in the absence of, of any others at the moment. Um, the first one was about um, the issue actually we discussed in, with, in the previous paper that while um, compliance with the 20 mile an hour might not have been um, as good as we might have hoped, that it did reduce excessive speeding. Now, I know that um, most of the, uh, the people who are driving on this road are within the current speed limit, um, but there are um, a number who are driving excessively. It could could a similar argument be made, um, Daryl, that if we were to reduce the speed limit, that it might, while compliance might actually get worse, because you know if you were to introduce a 40, that it might cut excessive speeding, which is one of the major concerns. For a speed limit to be effective, it needs to reflect the road environment. In other words, it, it should be self-enforcing and the driver understands why they're being asked to, to reduce their speed limit. I think it's it's very clear when you have a uh, an urban development and then the driver understands you've got more activity, more shops, more houses, more businesses, footway, street lighting. You can visually see that there is a change in the road environment. Uh, one of the difficulties we have in some of our, our rural communities is that the absence of, a, of any sort of housing density, that it doesn't feel like an urban environment. So to put signs up on their own doesn't necessarily result in better compliance. Uh, at Ockmuir Bridge, uh, we, we see that the speeds are lower and compliance is good, but that may be because of the bend at the bottom of the hill and the narrow verge, the tightness of the bend, the lack of visibility. It could be because of the road layout. The speed limit on the Fife side was reduced because you've got a whole series of crests and dips and you've got a double line system. There's no overtaking over that whole section from Ockmuir Bridge to, to Leslie. Um, if, if we put in a reduced speed limit here, it's difficult to know whether there would be compliance or whether, as you suggest, that we may simply just eliminate the excessive speeding. If you only have the reduced speed limit over the section from Scotland Well, to West Bowhouse, we're likely then to see an increase in speeds along that straight as drivers take the opportunity to overtake. Um, we could lower the speed limit on that section, but again, because the visibility is good, drivers may still choose to overtake. Uh, so it's 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 a difficult one to answer that because again, we're trying to preempt what the driving behaviour will be like. Okay, thanks for that, Daryl. And my second question was on in terms of 
um, the means by which speed limits can re be reduced. So obviously we have the, the, the usual approach of a, 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 a traffic order. Um, I know there's this option of um, an experimental traffic order. Um, could you just explain more about what that is, what it can be used for, and in what circumstances that would be deemed appropriate? Um, the, the traffic regulation order is the legal document that makes the speed limit enforceable. For most of our spe speed limits, we will go straight to consultation on a full uh, TRO. With the Spaces for People uh, project last year, um, because of the sudden change in driver behaviour and, and road use behaviour, we were allowed to use a temporary TRO, a TTRO, uh, to introduce the 20 mile per hour speed limits uh, and the 40 mile per hour buffers. And that's normally only used at for roadworks or for emergency purposes. Experimental TRO is the sort of thing you would use for a trial. So the 20 miles per hour speed limit trial, which we reported on earlier, used an, an ETRO because that was a long term uh, trial it was it was all it was it was planned in advance uh, and we knew that that that, that was coming up and um, you still have to go through the same legal process there's still consultation involved on like the ttro which you can implement almost straight away um but an etro should only be used uh, where it has justification if the decision was taken to introduce a 40 miles per hour on all or part of this section of road We'd probably be looking to go into the into the full TRO consultation rather than using an experimental TRO. Um, there needs to be support from the Police Scotland as well for uh, for the introduction of an ETRO, um, and they would also be consulted on both a TTRO and a full traffic regulation order. Um, so I'm not sure whether the the particular scenario that we have here is necessarily appropriate for an ETRO. Um, and I suppose. Um if we if we were to look at um, reducing the speed limit, um, it, it, is there a way of doing it um, similar to what has happened with the um, 20 mile an hour trials of actually um, undertaking speed assessment in advance of introduction? And then once that has been put in place, and if so, would that affect the, the means by which um, you would you would seek to, you know, what would you use a TTRO, would you use an, a TRO type thing? Uh, yes, I think if we were going to make any changes, uh, we would look use the, you know, sort of the current data and follow that up with other surveys after the signing or any other road measures had, had been installed. Um, but again, so back to the fact that the, the police had said that they didn't consider uh, you know, a 40 miles per hour to be appropriate or necessary on this section of road, um, which, which is what the traffic and network team have stated in their report as well. So we would need to discuss with the police again whether they think that you know this is something that we should pursue or what demands it would place on them because there'd be an expectation for enforcement if compliance is poor. Mm. Okay, and just on that final uh, point, Daryl, I, I think that there was in the response back from the police they did say that while they did not um, support the introduction of a 40 mile an hour that they would you know, enforce it, resources permitting, should it be introduced, was that correct? Yes. Yeah, OK, right, thank you. Can I ask if there are any further questions from, from members before we move to considering the recommendations in, in the report? No? OK, right, well, um, I know this is, this is a, a difficult issue and um, there's a lot of information to consider um, and thank you very much for, for the work that, that Daryl and his team have done um, in, in, in putting together the report, which is, is very helpful um, and also to the residents for their deputation. Um, I think that we can all agree that the, the route action plan um, should be welcomed and is something that we would like to see progressed as, as soon as possible. Um, and I would ask that as part of that, um, consideration be given to some of the um, issues that have been raised by residents, including um, the issue of, of overtaking on certain stretches um, and also the um, safe footpath link from um, uh, Bowhouse to um, Scotland Well, which clearly is, is resources permitting. Um, and given the, um, the issues you've raised about there not being a particular um, specific sign for children crossing, if that could also be considered as part of the route action plan. 
Um, however, I, I do think that um, in relation to uh, 3.21, um, I, I do disagree with the, the recommendation. Um, I do think that given the concerns of, of residents and the, while compliance um, on, on the whole is, um, is uh, good with the speed limit, that the excessive speeding in certain cases is still a concern. Um, so I would like to um, amend uh, that or as part of my motion, um, do something slightly different um, and suggest that a 40 mile an hour uh, limit is introduced as soon as practicably possible um, with the um, speed uh, measurement information gathered once this has been introduced to inform uh, the, the, the future decision on this as part of the, the route action plan. Um, I won't, as part of the motion, make any uh, specification in relation to the means by which you do that. I think that's that would be an operational matter for, for officers to determine. Um, do I have a, a seconder? Councillor Robertson. Yes, this, um, as many of you know, I've, I've been a councillor for quite a number of years and um, this issue has been raised year after year after year after year. And um, it was, it, it, you're talking going, going back probably about 20 years, people have been asking for, for this road to be looked at and the speed limits to be reduced on it. Um, previous councillors and um, Portmore Community Council and local residents have lobbied hard year after year after year to have their concerns addressed. I think um, this is probably the best thing that we can do to try and, and ease the, the concerns that local people have about the speed of traffic on that road. I'm, as someone who knows the road really well, I, I, sh I share their concerns. I, I, I judge a road personally. If I would be happy to cycle it, I, I, I think it's a safe road. And I have to tell you, I've cycled nearly every road in Kinrosha. I have never, ever cycled the road between um, Ochmuir Bridge and Scotland Well, because I don't think it's safe. Um, so I, if it was a 40 mile limit, I think I would be, I would be happy to cycle it. So for that reason, it only, not just that reason, but that's, it, I think it's a really good thing if we can get this done and actually see if it does make a difference to the speed limits, the speed on the road, and it does uh, reassure children and residents that the road will hopefully be made safer. So I'm happy to second. Thank you for that, Councillor Robertson, and, and for absolute clarity and um, for the um, the minute as well, the, the proposal um, for the 40 mile an hour would be from the buffer um, at Scotland Well that has recently been intru introduced to the boundary with Fife at Ochmuir Bridge. Um, Daryl, I don't know if you wanted to just um, make any comment or seek any clarity on, on the, the proposal. Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we can look at or we, we can investigate that through the route action plan. If you're happy for that to be included rather than taking it just as a separate motion on its own, because there may be other traffic regulation orders to be introduced a lot over the length of the road. Um, but I just want to comment, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, there was reference to a request for a footway link between uh, West Bay House and Scotland Well. Um, although speeding and, and, and driver behaviour on the road has been a concern over a number of years, this is the first time we've been aware of a request for a footway link. I do need to explain to the, the members of, of the meeting that there is no land available within the road boundary to construct a footway. Uh, the verges are narrow um, and it's something that we can consider, but unless land is available uh, or there's agreement from local landowners, it's a project that's not likely to proceed within the near future. We have a long list of new rural footways and we are prioritising those projects that we can deliver where, where land is available. So it's something that will require a fair bit of investigation before we could give any commitment to delivering. Thank you for that, Daryl. No, I think we're we're absolutely cognizant of that, and, and that's why you know we've suggested that it's just the options are considered. Clearly, there are long-standing issues um, across the whole of Kenosha, but specifically in Port Moak, with the the um, issue of the lack of safe uh, link between mm. uh, Scotland Well and Kilmagadwood. So um, there are absolutely um, other other considerations there too. I'll take um, Andy and then come to Malcolm. Andy, thanks very much. Uh, 
Councillor Purvis. I'll just quickly go through the, the comments that I have. Um, one of the things I know is that the uh, actual uh, report or indeed the data gathering for the report was conducted during August last year. Um, I therefore ask Daryl for the valid validity of that data given that we were in the middle of a pandemic and most of us are working from home. So I would question the road numbers that are within the report. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, secondly, um, you know, it has been mentioned um, that the, you know, you're looking at the route action plan of the A911. We have a, a vast variety of signage between the Larder and Scotland Well, 20s, 30s, 40s, 20, 30, down, up and down all the way along. Um, we've already, you've already conceded there that, you know, you could look at the extension of the 40 mile an hour limit. Um, and assess that, you know, there's there's no reason why that can't be put in as a temporary thing, a temporary uh, speed limit um, that can be assessed in terms of compliance. Um, as a minimum, as a minimum, I would like to see the 40 mile an hour extended out to Bowhouse. Um, I appreciate that there's a long street after that. Um, and, and I have gone on record, so I'm not saying out of turn that I'm, 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 I'm a bit more nervous about extending up to the boundary of Fife, but, but I am all for any speed restrictions on any rural road, end of. So it, irrespective of my personal opinion, and I am, I am supportive of any action that would extend the restricted speed limits beyond the boundary. And if we can look at even a temporary measure, to see what that effect has out to Bowhouse, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% behind that. And um, you, you mentioned that um, you know obviously that that, that would require enforcement. Um, I have to say that, that that you know we've gone over old ground here. The 20 mile an hour speed limits in the centres of population are not getting enforced. And um, we are seeing average speeds of 33 miles an hour through Kinneswood in a 20 mile an hour zone. Um, that's the 85th percentile. So, you know, the, the signage isn't working. Um, we, we've talked about physical mitigation, but the reality of it is, is without enforcement, without a, a speed camera, uh, sorry, a speed gun or something being there, then it, it's not going to work. So I would rather see 40 mile an hour signs put up and see whether that does reduce the excessive speeding as it has only had effect in the centres of population. That would be better than no effect whatsoever. So I, I think that that would certainly be a, as a minimum what I would like to see considered in this stretch of road. And beyond that, obviously, the, there are additional issues I granted, and, and that has that is for the route action plan. So, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that anything is better than nothing at this moment in time. And we have to take account of, of, the, of the concerns of these residents, particularly in relation to road safety. And I know that you've got a lot of other sites, you've mentioned there are 800 sites you're considering, and I absolutely get the council's position on that. This is the Kinrosshire Committee. We are concentrating on issues in Kinrosshire, and so forgive us if we bang the pans and, and beat the drums for our area because that's how we that's how we see it. Okay, thank you for that, Andy and Malcolm. You're on mute. Sorry, I was just um, sort of give a, a short alternative view, probably an unpopular one, um, but to point out that, that that's a arterial road, a local route uh, into Fife, and by introducing a lower speed limit, all you're going to do is increase uh, driver frustration because nobody's taken into account that people actually have to get from A to B from Kenrosher into other areas. Um, I'm all for um, other actions, signage, um, warning signage for like the bus stop, etc. Um, but I do feel that constantly um, lowering speed limits for motorists um, going through Kenrosher is just going to increase um, frustration, uh, which increases um, bad driving, overtaking, etc. That's just my point. Okay, thank you for that, Malcolm. Thank you. Are there any further comments from any members of the committee? No. Okay, so oh sorry. Slur sorry, water. Can right. I can I can I just make a quick comment and just just uh, you know when uh, Peter Marshall and, and Darrell sort of saying they will have a look at the 
the issues with the uh, children getting on school buses just you know I think that's an important part of this as well and just appreciate that they're both going to go away and have a look at this and and hopefully come back to to elected members a uh, community council but most importantly to the residents uh, to, to to see what can be done just to make it to make it uh, safer uh, for kids getting on on and off the bus thank you OK, thank you. So just before we conclude, then just to summarise um, what we're what is being proposed, um, that the, the route action plan um, is progressed and takes into consideration those other issues that we have highlighted um, about overtaking um, signage and uh, also the, um, foot, the safe footpath link and um, noting Richard's point that um, Daryl and Peter are going to get back to us on the, the school, uh, the children crossing for school. And that um, separately, we will seek to introduce the 40 mile an hour limit as soon as practically practicably possible along the um, stretch from the existing 40 mile an hour buffer at Scotland Well to the boundary with Fife, um, and that uh, the assessments of the uh, speed uh, the speed uh, compliance is used um, as part of the route action plan to inform whether um, that is made permanent. Okay, are we agreed? OK, I'll take agreed. It. agreed. OK, thank you. Right. Well, I will hand back to the convener to take item six. Uh, thank you, Callum. Um, item six is the former Blairingown Primary School uh, report. Um, I would ask members to note um, para one three. Um, the school was declared surplus to requirements contrary to the wishes of at least three of the local members in June 2019. Um, we did put out a residence letter uh, following that uh, to gauge interest in um, retaining the school for community use and that was inconclusive and the, it was actually a poor response, to be honest. Um, the, the main point I would like to say under the paragraph about community facilities in the area. Well, yes, there are some, but there are none in the village itself, which I think is the important point. Um, during the period I've been a councillor, the Blaring has lost virtually all its facilities that it did have. Um, not. not it's significant actually what, what has been lost there. Uh, it is a pattern in rural villages, but it's accentuated in Blaring Down, I would say. Um, I was concerned that the slow progress in developing a community trust might mean decisions taken on the school's future before it was established. Uh, but the proposals in Paris 4 3, 4 1 to 4 3, um, do buy the community time for one year to consider the viability of lease or asset transfer. So I'm quite happy with that approach from from the report. I, I don't know whether Officer Haxton, if he's present, wishes to expand on that report from what I've said. Are you there, Lee? Yes, I'm, I'm here, Convener. Um, happy to answer any questions. There's nothing more I would wish to add to, to what you've outlined from the report. Thank you. OK, well, do we have any questions or comments on uh, on the report or what I've said? Mm. Um, is that you, Callum, coming in with a question? I think Councillor Waters was ahead of me. OK, Richard. Thank, thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, probably a question for you, actually, convener. Um, a lot of this looks like the Fossaway Community Development Trust uh, 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 and the potential in, a, um, in finding a, a community type solution to save, you know, a community that, that has really lost all its community buildings. Um, and has nothing left and I, I fully support what you said that it would be good to have that the, this this could be safe for the community and, and used by the community but just to ask you 
the development trust, what stage are we at? Are, are you are is 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 it at in setting that up? And is it likely that it will be set up in time? Uh, yeah, within this year period. Thanks. What I can tell you, Richard, is we've worked for a year on setting up one in Fossaway, but we've had an approach from the neighbouring parish of Mockett, which is in Clackmannan district. Um, they are also trying to set one up, and we're now uh, in the process of convening some talks about a joint trust, and I'm very much hoping that that will happen this spring. Uh, certainly, I'd be very disappointed if it didn't, given the momentum to date and the background work that's already been done. So I would feel pretty confident that we will have a trust in place um, by um, the end of the spring this year. And one of the items that is a priority for us would, I think, be uh, what we can do in relation to the school. One member of the trust is from the Blair and Gone area and she is in touch with um, other residents and and former uh, parents of you know parents of uh, former school children uh, and I think there is a definite interest in in what is proposed okay good to hear thank you right um, do you want to come in next Callum with a question Please. If that's a convener, I've got two yeah. questions actually. If okay. Allow. Um, the first one is on the the, the funding for um, the, the the necessary works to upgrade the the building. It's given a suggestion of thirty thousand pounds that would be required to get it back into a suitable standard. I'm just wondering if perhaps um, one of the officers could outline the options available because I know that you know securing funding um, of that might be one of the um, the things that communities might be hesitant about. And uh, while I know there is funding available for community asset transfer and the like, if we were to explore a lease option, does the council have any funds in order to undertake that work um, ourselves? That's the first question. I can take the answer to that, or part of the answer to that, convener, if you're happy. Yes, Fiona, Fiona. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the question, Councillor Purvis. Um, just to, to double check, you're asking about um, options for funding the repair and um, upgrade works that would be required rather than costs to the commu any community group to develop and put in place a lease, because sometimes we get asked that as well. Um, in terms of options to find the capital costs to repair and get the building you know, to a sufficient standard that it could be used by the community, one of the advantages of the development trust um, option is that development trusts have access to grants and other sources of funding that the council doesn't. Um, and um, we can have a look with the trust, you know, as it emerges and gets itself set up and settled down to see what the, what options there might be. Um, there are um, there are a range of funding options available to independent community led trusts, so we can can work with Fossilway um, to to look at those. The council's own capital. Um, Budget, as councillors will know, is is pretty hard pressed, and there are quite a few buildings that are already in use. Um, that uh, we have a town hall in Cooper Angus, for example, um, where we're needing to look at how we use our existing funds to prioritise those buildings that already um, have not been closed and um, are still in use by the community. On the cost of um, just briefly to say, just on the cost of working to get a lease in place, you know, legal costs, advice to a community organisation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, there are various routes available to community organisations to help meet those costs. And again, we can work um, with the Development Trust to, to look at those. One option is the Community Investment Fund, which is a council fund, which is exactly for this kind of project. 
Okay, thank you. And Thanks, my Fiona. second question, if I may, convener. Yes, on you go, Callum. Um, it was the reference in the report to the discussion at the Council's Corporate Property Asset Management Group and the recommendation to dispose of the property which has been put on, on hold. Um, so, so two parts to this question. Does dispose mean sell or does dispose include things like community asset transfer? I assume it doesn't include lease because that's not disposing it. So that's the first part. And then the second part is on hold. Is that on hold? I know the recommendation says that it's sort of looking at reviewing it in 12 months time once the development trust is up and running. Can we just have um, some reassurance that the council wouldn't wouldn't move in advance of that timescale on disposal? Thank so on, on the first part to your question, Councillor Purvis, yes, disposal can mean a number of things. It can mean marketing a building for sale, for commercial sale. It can mean disposing of it to the community um, for the benefit of the community. So it's a it's a broad term. Um, and on the second part to your question, um, yes, I mean, I think the, the report is clear. Um, at para 3.2 about that and of course there will be the minute of this meeting um, just noting and flagging that potential to dispose of the building you know that that's not going to happen in a rush there have been situations in the past we did a community asset transfer um, up in Highland Perthshire quite recently where um, you know we moved quite fast on that because there was a development trust, a local organisation that was sort of ready and willing to crack on. Um, I think uh, the council has a legal obligation to look at all of the options when it's disposing of assets and making sure that it's getting you know, best value for um, those assets. But um, it's always, always keen to find a community led solution. Um, where there's potential to do that and the Community Empowerment Act, which became law uh, six, seven years ago now, it really emphasises that. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to see happen. We want to work with communities to see buildings like this school um, turned around to be, you know, an active, vibrant asset for a local community, especially a small place. At Blair and gone for the reasons that you and the convener have set out but there's got to be um, a viable group on the ground which is up for that. Thank you. Thanks Fiona. Now I see that um, Sarah Bruce Jones of Fossil ACC wants to uh, ask a question. Sarah. <clears throat> Thank you convener. Um, I think it's actually been covered. Um, what I wanted to find out was if we cannot find a community solution, whether it's the um, Development Trust or others, what is the likely fate of that building and the land around it? If that's what I'm thinking is that you know, if we, if I, I probably organizing the community to the, if they knew that if we don't get the Community Development Trust up and running and a community solution found, that that building is going to be lost. So I think I probably can't um, say more than, you know, if in 12 months time there isn't appetite from the community to look at asset transfer or taking on a lease, then the council will have to look at moving to dispose. But I can't say more than, than that in terms of what that disposal route might be. Um, could I just come in on one point which has occurred to me, which was raised by the member of the trust that lives in the Blairingone area because uh, there was a um, in the school playground there was a small shelter I think that has been removed which I think the children were, had been involved with. Um, could I just make the point that it might be worth keeping some dialogue about about any changes that occur to the property in this interim period with the community? If you know what I mean, um, so that certain things aren't done that maybe they wouldn't want to be done. If you know what I mean, I'm not talking about the building itself, more the area around it, I suppose. Mm. If you get the point. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about that particular issue, uh, Kavina, so I can't really um, 
say anything very helpful on that front. It may have been removed for you know good reasons around mm. health and safety, mm. what, what, whatever. But I mean, certainly when, whenever something is happening to a building which is going to, you know, make an impact, um, or that the community is going to notice or be concerned about, we always try to um, to let you know interested parties know in advance. But that's not always possible. Yeah. Do you know anything further, Lee, on that point? I'm afraid not, Convener. The only information I'm aware of is that the following the um, building condition survey, which is mentioned in the report, there have been some incidents, I believe, with some low level vandalism and other damage to the property, which may have an impact on the, the costs of uh, redevelopment and may also be issues which community members would be interested to know about, but of course, are as a result of anything the Council has done. OK, um, anyway, uh, I think we see the recommendations in the re in the report. I mean, um, are we are we content? I think, Richard, were you thinking of moving that, moving that we move the paper as it is? Yes, yes, convener, I would like I would like to move move this paper. I think I think uh, it's important that we protect our, our, our local communities to, uh, throughout throughout the whole area. Uh, Blairingon sits in a little peninsula that has that has Clickmanager to the north and, and, and west and Fife to the east. Um, and it's lost uh, many public buildings, uh, including uh, within within my term in the council, uh, the Blairingon, Blairingon School. Um, immediately after that loss, uh, we had discussions about you know, trying to protect it as a as a community asset, and and I'm glad this paper has come forward and given a clear opportunity and a clear roadmap on on how to achieve that. Uh, and and the news uh, coming out that the development trust is 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 reasonably along the way to to get set up, which will give a a mechanism uh, under the uh, community asset transfer program or 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 other option that's set out within the paper. So I'm happy to move this and feel it's a it's a, a fair and, and the, the right way to go to try and protect to protect one of our communities. OK, I'm happy to second that, Richard. Are we agreed uh, as a committee to uh, to the uh, the motion and seconding of the of the recommendations in the report? Agreed. agreed. OK. Thank you. Now, item seven, I'm conscious of time, uh, so we'll try and be as quick as possible. Item seven refers to the coordination of planning and management in the Lomond and Oakal Hills. Um, this item was proposed by me to stimulate discussion on making a recommendation to council on engaging with neighbouring councils and the Scottish Government on the principle and funding of proposals to improve coordination of planning and management in the Lomond and Oakle Hills, including but not limited to the extension of the Lomond Hills Regional Park to include Loch Leven and the establishment of an Oakle Hills Regional Park. Um, Committee members should have the background documents. Um, Oakal Hills, a special place, um, and a briefing note on the um, coordination of planning and management in the Oakal Hills. Um, these were prepared by Drew Jamieson um, and have been circulated. Um, the first version was 2013 updated in 2016 it requires a further update and basically was created with the support of friends of the Oakles as an advocacy and awareness raising document um, circulated to selected policy makers and stakeholders who might be able to promote the well-being of the Oakle Hills which are incredibly popular hill area for walkers and the briefing note 
was created together with Friends of the Oakles in 2019 as an assessment of options following participation in the 2019 review of regional parks organised by the Scottish Campaign for National Parks and the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland, whose council I'm on. So the basic point Drew was making is taken together to form part of a wider discussion is the best approach. Um, there was also an email from John Mayhew of Rural Scotland, uh, basically. Um, he was outlining the the new sort of climate now uh, from the Scottish Government in terms of their shared policy programme and impetus behind national and regional parks and possible funding therefor. So that's the background to this item. I understand there's support in Kinrosha for exploring with neighbouring authorities the possible creation of a regional park in the Ockles and extending the Lomond Park to Loch Leven. This cannot happen without the cooperation of the neighbouring authorities. There are other wards involved of the council as well and funding from the Scottish Government. We realise that. So the intention of making a recommendation to council is to kickstart that process given this new impetus from the Scottish Government's government shared policy programme. It could also have the other benefit of addressing the loss of the local landscape area for Rumbling Bridge Gorge by seeking to include that part of the Devon within the park boundary if we were successful. So um, I'm wondering from the reading of the documents whether you support us taking this further, but perhaps before I ask for comment, um, I wonder whether Peter Marshall, whether you might want to say something on what I've said, because I know we've discussed this before. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, convener. Can I presume from your comments that the briefing note I was asked to prepare wasn't circulated? I haven't seen that. Right, OK, it was, it was prepared by one of the team, but if I can maybe make some comments uh, regarding it. Yeah, um, of course. Some of it I, I think you'll probably be aware, but regional parks are a focus on recreation. They are, you know, set up in legislation under the uh, 67 Countryside Act, which has been updated in 81, um, but not, you know, subsequently be been updated. Um, I can maybe also uh, quote from the most recent advice which is way out of date, I should say. It's 2012 from SNH at the time was um, designation of new regional parks was not identified as a priority by SNH in the short to medium term. Now, quite what they mean by short to medium term, I don't know. And the emphasis should be in proving and contributing to existing parks. Um, so there's a you know, an implication there that they are not looking to identify new parks. Um, the question of funding, I should say that the uh, independent funding of regional parks uh, or sorry, separate funding of regional parks was withdrawn by the Scottish Government and it became part of the block grant system to councils. So, you know, there is no harm in asking, but I've got a feeling I know what the, the answer is, but I think one of the key things in terms of the council proposing the designation of a regional park, they have to build up a case that it is of regional significance and not local significance. In fact, it talks about being regional and national significance and, and not local significance. So I, I think I think it would be difficult to proceed in the absence of an overall assessment of the need and benefits of a regional park in uh, Perth and Kinross as a wider area. So there's some difficulties uh, there. And um, 
I, I would say that on the assumption that it may be objections to it is a matter for the Scottish ministers to determine following a, uh, a public inquiry. So it's quite a sort of complex uh, procedure. Um, the, the other point in terms of uh, your comments regarding the boundary, I wonder if the suggestion that it should include Loch Leven would immediately raise uh, objections from um, Nature Scott, who as the managers of the National Nature Reserve, you local members and, and community members will be aware they have shied away from promoting Loch Leven as a recreational resource on the water. Um, so I would suggest you maybe think about the boundaries, you know, of the the, the park and the fact that Loch Leven is already managed as a national nature reserve probably means it's not essential to be part of a regional park. So there are complications in that and I yeah, we can sh we can share this note uh, you know which goes into more detail from what I've said so I'm happy to try and answer questions um if I could just come back on it Peter just mm -hmm. for a moment um my concept was as far as the Lomans was concerned was purely the land fall from the hill area down to the edge of uh, Loch Leven, right. pre predominantly in the Port Moak CC area, not the whole of Loch Leven. Um, that's the first point. The second point is, I I, I know what you say about SNH uh, in 2012, but the new Scottish Government shared policy programme with the joint uh, administration specifically states belief in the important role regional parks have in protecting Scotland's landscapes, restoring our environment and opening up access to quality greenscape. And they also talk, uh, they actually state agreement to increase the amount of funding available to improve visitor facilities, safety measures and access opportunities including in existing regional parks and potentially new ones now that is an email from rural scotland of the 24th of november uh, last year so i think we've moved on a bit and all i'm trying to do is engender some discussion about the the potential for improvements in these two areas uh, with and um, without involving neighbouring authorities to see what their views are, we're not going to get anywhere and we're not going to make any progress at all. We know that it may not go anywhere, but all I'm suggesting through this potential motion to the full council is that we explore the options. That's really the spirit of this paper, uh, Peter. Um, I've got a couple of comments in, in the box, but I, are they relating to this item? Um, um, Andy Miller, were you wanting to comment? Yes, thank you, Gambino. Just very quickly, because I'm aware of time is, is, yeah. is passing on. Um, any impetus on this should be embraced. I'm 100% I'm behind it, um, and certainly the, the PCC is. Um, based on the initial discussions that we had prior to the setting up of the committee, this is precisely what we believe the Kinrosha Committee should be getting involved in. A holistic approach that involves all of the relevant community councils that, that obviously that, that we're talking about here. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we, we have a fantastic resource, I think, particularly, I know you've talked about Loch Leven and, and the reasons why some uh, some organisations may wish to exclude them, but I think it should be included because we have the Heritage Trail that, that is a fantastic resource that passes through several community council areas, um, you know, and, and I think that, that it can be managed within that. So I'm all for including this and bringing it holistically within the, the realms of, you know, the, the Roman Hills Regional Park and bringing it down up to the shores of Loch Leven and including Loch Leven itself. So I'll leave my comments at that. 
thank you, Andy, and I'm really grateful for your support. Council, Councillor Purvis, do you want to come in now? Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, just to endorse some of the comments that, that you and Andy have made, and um, I didn't realise there was there was supposed to be a briefing. So, so Peter, absolutely, that would be helpful for us to to see. Um, but I suppose just to to um, reiterate the point you made about um, the, the statement from the Scottish government as part of their new programme for government, I think the issue is without agreement from other councils, clearly this isn't going to happen. Without funding, I think we're, if we're all being realistic, you know, given the constraints on local authorities, Perth and Kinross is no exception, that without funding directly from the Scottish Government for regional parks, we will not be able to do this. However, as it seems that there is now an appetite to look at um, such, such measures, um, I think that we should get our foot in the door and say that we are interested, so that if it is something that's going to be explored, um, sorry, I probably should stop talking. I see there's a point of order. Yes, uh, Richard, you've got a point of order. Yes, uh, sorry, uh, given given that Peter, one of Peter Marshall's um, uh, team has produced a paper on this, would it would it not be competent just to just to bring this back to 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 stop this and bring it back at a future a future meeting of this committee at, uh, when the papers can uh, be before us so that we can uh, see more details on the issues uh, regarding it. Could I just ask Peter, from what's been said by myself, uh, Port Moxie, C's rep and Councillor Purvis, do you think your briefing note would significantly change our aspiration to, um, to discuss uh, at full council engaging with other authorities? Do you think it would make a significant difference? Uh, to be honest, if we are just doing an exploratory letter to the government and to, uh, I presume we're talking about Fife and Click Manninshire. Yeah. And yes, it would and be Stirling, Fife, Stirling as well. And, and other wards in Perth and Kinross, obviously. And, and if we were making it quite clear to them that we had not investigated the regional uh, importance of this and we were not promising to take it to the next step if it was just exploratory i you know I, it might help inform the debate with council because what i would say is if there was a desire to take this forward we'd have to do an assessment of its regional significance not its local significance and that is much wider and, and why it was a priority for Perth and Kinross Council. That's a big piece of work. But if there wasn't A funding from the government and B support from the adjoining authorities, it's almost impossible to take forward. So I, I don't think the the note would change it if it was purely exploratory uh conversations with adjoining authorities yeah that is my perception what we're trying to do here is kickstart a process to see if, see if there is interest from neighboring authorities uh, other ward councillors in on the north side of the Ocals, um and also the government's perspective on 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 you know kick-starting the process of discussion on land management in the in the Ocals. So yes, it would be an exploratory letter and that would be the spirit of the motion we're talking about. So I think with respect, um, Richard, I'd like to move forward on it, but I see Lisa wants to come in with a point of clarification. Mm. I think I think perhaps you've um, um, clarified it to a degree yourself Mike by explaining that this would be a political motion by yourself because obviously the decision to pursue any exploration of this would need to be one that would be taken by full council and so what's actually being uh, discussed here is whether or not um, the local area committee has an appetite for this to be pursued and the mechanism for that would be for it to be raised as a political motion um, uh, at full council for them to determine whether or not this was something that the council wished to proceed with um, by way of these initial explorations. So it was just to, just to make sure that we were clear and not conflating um, the two the, the responsibilities of the two fora. Yeah, 
That is exactly the case. Yeah, Richard, I see you coming in with a question. Mm. Yeah, I'd be quite happy, Mike, if you if you want to to move forward, this absolutely quite happy with that. Uh, just uh, regarding the report that was uh, uh, being prepared, uh, can we still have access to that, Peter? I have no problem with that. I'll, I'll arrange. Our oh, committee services have a a copy if they're happy to send it out. It, it's not a report, I should say. It was just designed as a briefing note. I think it would be Thank useful you. information, Peter. And I think it, basically the point is, if we agree to take this to take this further to the full council, if the committee agree that, uh, then. Uh, we'll obviously have to have background information, you know, on on why we why we're trying to do this for members at the time. So I would like to move that we do that if the committee is so minded. Um, do I have anyone to second me on that approach? Happy to formally second that. Um, just in the interest of time, Camino, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. We agreed then on that one. Agreed. OK, thank you. Now the next item is item eight, and I know we're running out of time, so we'll try and be as quick as possible. This is on the Kinross Town Centre Regeneration Scheme and um, Vice Convener Purvis, will you take that report, Callum? Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, uh, as uh, Councillor Barnacle says, this is on the, the Kinross Town Centre Regeneration Scheme. Um, there have been uh, issues raised for some time by uh, members of the uh, public and um, the Community Council um, and other um, local um, organisations about some of the specific um, implementation of the, the scheme, including issues like road safety and parking. Um, while uh, most people, I think, um, are pleased about the, the general improvement in the appearance that the scheme has, has brought, um, there are still some concerns and uh, we were keen to see um, an assessment done um, and uh, an attempt to get community views on this to look at whether any improvements could be made. Um, so I'll just ask if there are any questions on the report from members. <coughs> Councillor Robertson. Yes, uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, a number of, the, I'm quite happy with the report, and um, I'm glad it's it's been it's been brought before us. Um, but there's a number of things in the in the report in the proposals, like in 2.4 and 2.7, um, to do uh, bring forward further to do further investigations. Have we got any idea of the time scale for that to happen? Because I know for a fact that Kinross Community Council and other and elected members have been asking for a follow up report on the on the, the scheme for, for quite a number of years now and nothing's happened. So can we get any idea of the sort of time scale when this further information will be provided? OK, um, John McCroon. Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Robertson. Um, yes, we could do that quite quickly, certainly in terms of views around the use of the space. Uh, I'd need to seek uh, a view from Brian Cargill uh, in relation to the further review of, of road safety, but we could certainly initiate a uh, survey quite quickly in relation to how people perceive the use of the space and potential demand for it. Um, the whole intention is that this is a space that can be used for a variety of purposes uh, and it would be great to get some uh, evidence and support from community groups in terms of their intention about how they want to use it. Previous uh, analysis in terms of traffic uh, issues uh, suggested that there was limited uh, impacts in terms of road safety, but my road colleagues would need to uh, address that. I don't know whether Brian you're available to come in or not. But we can do the community survey quickly. OK, thanks, John. I don't know if Brian is here. I yes, see up there. Yes, he is. So, yeah, thanks, Councillor. Thanks, Convener, for, for, for this. Uh, yes, as Macaulay John said there, um, from our point of view, from the, the survey side of it, that there shouldn't be a great uh, problem with us pulling together 
uh, traffic surveys to give us an indication of what the, the, the current position is. Um, clearly, we've got some information from some years ago, um, uh, so I'd be happy to undertake that remit um, and, and delivery of that. Um, there, there, there clearly will be a lot of other priorities on at the moment, but I, I would be happy to, to, to give you the undertaking that we can do that before the end of the financial year and get surveys carried out, that's, that's for sure. I'm, I'm happy with that. The only other thing I was going to ask was, um, there, there's been particular requests for um, some sort of giveaway signage to be provided at the, at the junction of Burns Beg Street with the High Street, and I've written to Mr Cargill about that. Is that going ahead apart from the, the, the other work that's going to take place? Brian? Yes, certainly that, that was that was looked at. I think one of the issues there, I think, was the actual material um, where we would normally look to place the, the, the road markings. The material itself doesn't uh, uh, welcome uh, road marking uh, uh, material, um, but certainly the advanced signing, we have the ability to put up a giveaway sign. Um, uh, it was very quickly looked at when we were asked to pull this paper together. Um, but we haven't had an opportunity to look at it in more detail. But again, we're happy to undertake that and, and come back to, to yourselves with a, a report on that. That's super, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Robertson. And not to preempt the survey, but I think that it's very likely that that will be one of the major requests as uh, Councillor Robertson has highlighted from the local community. Councillor Waters. Thank you, Vice Convener. Just, uh, just re regarding the the uh, paved car park that's getting upgraded. Part of that money, or part of the project, was to connect up with the the high street, and it's mentioned in this report. Is there any progress report on on where we are with the elements that are within the council's the council's uh, remit, rather than the down at the car park itself? So the connecting up from the bottom of Pier Road up to the the town centre to get that connection between the, the tourism and the, the economy on the high street. Thanks. Thanks. John McCrone, you wanted to come in? Uh, yes, I'm happy to kind of share information on that. Uh, so uh, by and large, uh, good progress in terms of the complete delivery of the scheme. Um, I don't have the figure before me, but I can share that with you. OK, thank you. Um, I had a question uh, myself, if that's OK. And um, just on the consultation itself, um, can I just have some assurance that we will be using both um, traditional and online means of uh, getting information? Clearly in Kinross, we're very lucky to have the, the Kinross newsletter, which has a very um, high readership locally. And I would think that it would be useful to have some form of, of paper survey um, done uh, through the, the newsletter. And certainly that was one of the suggestions that we made previously, as well as I know the council has the online consultation hub and the, the road safety team have their own um, system that I've seen used recently. So if, if I could just have that um, assurance, please. John? Yes, no, again, happy to do that. It would be my colleague Emily Queen, um, City and Town Centre Management Officer that would be involved. So we will seek to engage with community groups, business groups uh, and uh, residents and put it out through uh, all channels that you wish us to do so. Excellent. And uh, Emily is uh, local, so um, that's even, even better. OK, thank you for that. Any further uh, questions um, on the report? No, OK, um, I'll ask if um, there's anyone wanting to, to move the report. Councillor Robertson. Oh, thank you, Vice uh, Thank you, Vice Commissioner. Yes, I'm happy to move the report. Um, and I, I think I, I think I'll just, if I may, can I, if I can show you this, if it will come up in front of you, I don't know if you can see it. It's called the Kinross, it's a paper, a report called the Kinross Strategy, and it was, it was written by partly written by a council officer called Peter Marshall back in 1995. And this can, the, the Kinross strategy set out a whole lot of, it was like a, a local plan for the town of Kinross involving um, the uh, creation of a bypass, the upgrade of the town centre, even suggested a thing like a round a loch path. And all the things that were contained within, almost all the things contained within this Kinross strategy have now been uh, achieved. And uh, as well as moving the, the report, I think it would be good if 
um, circumstances allow that we could have another Kinross strategy, perhaps a Kinrosser strategy in the years ahead, because I, I think if you have a plan that you can work to, it might take years to get there, but um, it's, a, it's a good thing to have and, and all communities could benefit from it. But I'm happy to move the report just now. Thank you. OK, um, John, you wanted to, I think, pick up on the point that Willie raised. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, my fingers losing the will. Um, yes, no, happy to explore that. Obviously, we are looking at place based investment uh, frameworks with community development colleagues, so happy to advise how that could be progressed in terms of a refresh of the strategy, which I also was involved in as well. So be, both Pete and I have been around for a while, so we're very pleased to see some of those things come to fruition. OK, thanks. And do we have a seconder for uh, Willie's motion? I'm, I'm, I'm happy, happy just to, to second, second that. Fine. OK, great. Any comments on the report? David, maybe just on behalf of Kinross CC, are you happy with the, um, the suggestion? Yeah, it's, it's, it's taking us a long time to get there, but hopefully we're getting somewhere now. And I'd just like to say, along with Willie, I remember, remember quite clearly the strategy has been set up in 1995. And yeah, it's maybe time it was reviewed and moved up a, a gear to cover the next 10, 15 years. OK, thanks, David. Any further comments or can we agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. OK, and um, convener, I would perhaps suggest, given that, um, that we're slightly over time, and um, we're yet to be informed when the next four week window for the Boundary Commission uh, consultation is, so it's not time sensitive, that we could perhaps defer paper nine, given that there would need to be some discussion on the wording of the response there, um, assuming you're content with that. Yes, Callum, I, I didn't know what the state of play was with the second consultation, which you were obviously more aware of. So since we don't know that, I think we can defer that to the what I think will be the next meeting in March. But that that may may pre, you know, it depends what what's happening with the consultation. But uh, we can always call a special meeting just to discuss that, can't we? OK. Yes, happy to defer item nine, which takes me to item 10 which is the Kinross Common Good Fund. I would ask the committee to agree the agenda note in relation to applications decided in December 2021 and to homologate the decisions made. These decisions would normally be made under 3.04 of our delegated scheme, but we had not met, so we had to do something uh, at the time. So that's why this has come as a sort of, well, this is what we decided. Do you agree? Uh, so um, I'm assuming that the that the committee will will simply rubber stamp that. Agreed. OK. And um, the item 11 on committee forward planning, I think uh, I was going to ask you, Callum, to run with this, but I think given the time, uh, is it not the case that we were going to agree to meet between between this meeting and our next meeting with all committee members to discuss this further? Yeah, I think that's fair. We've got an initial idea from community councils um, and they've submitted to us the key areas of, of priority, as have ward councillors. Um, but perhaps as part of an informal um, development session type meeting, uh, we can meet to work on the, the forward plan in advance of the next formal meeting in about eight weeks time. OK, well, we'll agree to do that and um, move on that uh, post the meeting. One or two people haven't been able to comment, but um, the point is that it, we've really struggled to find <laughs> to meet the time scale of two hours. Uh, 
but we've managed it. So that just shows you how important this this committee is to the, the many issues that come up in Kinross Shire. Um, and I would um, say that um, I believe that probably our next meeting is likely to be the third weekend, the third in the third week of March, possibly the 24th of March, which is a Thursday, I think, but that will need to be confirmed with uh, committee services. But that's what I think could well be the next meeting of this committee. OK. I'd like to thank everybody for attending and I hope you think it's been worthwhile.